so I heard this Baptist Baptist person in the southern states he had a problem with gambling and he would go to horse races and anytime he would bet on the horse he would lose and at one time he was watching this priest and a priest would come to a horse and bless a horse and when he would bless the horse horse would win he saw it happen twice so that the third race that was there and he lost in both of those races he decided to go to the ATM machine withdrew all of his retirement all of his savings and was watching for the horse that the priest would bless and saw that the priest came to this horse and didn't just sprinkle him and bless him this priest touched horse everywhere on his head on his legs on his tail everywhere he just sprinkled stuff he said I bet this is gonna be the horse that's gonna win all of the race he puts all of his money in and in the middle of the race horse died he runs to the priest and he says I don't understand he says do you understand that I gave all of my money to win the race and he says you blessed all of the horses and they won and this horse he said he died and the priest looked at him he says that's the problem with you Protestants he says you don't know the difference between blessing and the last rite <laughs> only the Catholics understood the last rite is when you pray for the person who's dying <laughs> and all the Catholics said ex-Catholics said <sighs> the Protestants like what <laughs> Luke chapter 11 let's go to our Bible well, let me share one that you will understand <laughs> so this person dies and goes to heaven and in heaven he meets up uh, Peter and Peter shows him and says that each person that there's a clock that represents your life in heaven you know if the clock goes slow it means you did very little sins and so they show Billy Graham's clock it's like barely moving and they show Mother Teresa's clock it's also barely moving and so this person's like where's my clock they said oh your clock we have it in the office as a fan <laughs> okay everyone understood that one okay that's good gospel of Luke chapter 11 and verse 24 if you do not have a Bible you can go ahead and watch on the screen or just listen as I will read when the unclean spirit goes out of a man he goes to dry places someone say dry places he is seeking rest and finding none he says I will return to my house from which I came and when he comes he finds it swept and put in order he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they enter and dwell there and the last state of that man is worse than the first I'm going to speak to you a message that will be titled keeping demons out the bible makes us to understand that it's possible to get healed and lose a healing jesus told one man who was healed he says don't sin otherwise worse can happen to you bible makes us to understand you can receive an inheritance from god and lose it the story of prodigal son is a good example of that the Bible also makes us to understand you can have an anointing on your life and like Samson lose it. We also see a story of a coin being lost, a sheep being lost and a son being lost. And this scripture makes us to understand that a person can receive freedom and then afterwards lose that freedom. And Jesus makes us to understand that there is something worse than being demon oppressed something worse than having a demon tormenting your life and you may say what can be worse than that it's when you have seven of those demons and that's worse than the first or the one we see that also in practical aspect of life a lot of people today they seek to get married and a lot of people think as long as I get married that's gonna have a great life but we all know those of you who are married getting married is very easy yes it's not that easy because you know the wedding and all this stuff but in reality compared to staying married getting married is piece of cake getting a car is easy 
you can apply and you can qualify for the for the payments it's paying the payments and upkeeping the car that is not easy a lot of those of you who uh, tried it you know that losing weight is not hard just going through a few breakups and depressing moments and and you lose it or somebody calls you you know fat or something and it spirals you to go just run and everything I remember when a few years ago I just got married and my pastor and one day mentioned four times that I am overweight hurt me so deeply that it was winter I remember I went home and I told my wife and I said I am overweight and my pastor thinks I'm overweight I think I have like some kind of a spirit I put on my running shoes at late at night 9 p.m freezing weather I went running for like four miles almost died because I didn't run for like five years before that I lose weight you know I lost weight really quickly but it's keeping that that's a challenge most of you know that a lot of NBA players the statistic says that 70 percent of NBA players go broke after two from two to four years after they retire and 60 percent after five years some of you heard a story about Shaquille O'Neal when he at a young age he, get, he got drafted by uh, NBA and before he even played a game for NBA they gave him one million dollars as part of like a bonus of joining NBA and Shaquille O'Neal took one million dollars and went with his friends to a club or went to a place and spent one million dollars in 30 minutes some of you girls cannot even do that I mean that's radical his bank bank loan officer when he heard that he met with Shaquille O'Neal and he says Shaquille O'Neal you are on your way to be part of the amazing statistic that all the NBA players after they retire are broke he said you already have proven you have the skills for that and Shaquille O'Neal was in college actually he quit college because of that and so after playing for 19 seasons for NBA while playing for NBA he decided to go back to school he finished his associates finished his bachelor's finished his master's and then finished his PhD in finance while, play, while playing basketball and then when he retired you know and he uh, somebody calculated that he made 292 million dollars from NBA and he shot 28,596 points played 19 seasons and most of us know this player he's very tall and you know very big and very powerful very powerful player but when he retired and now he owns 155 restaurants including 15, 17 other restaurants some 40 uh, fitness centers some other I think 20 or something uh, car washes and many many other today he makes more in the week that somebody calculated he made in NBA in the month no longer playing for NBA and when they asked him you know what is your secret and he said this he says it's one thing to make money but he says you have to be educated enough to keep that money and see my friend it's one thing to get freedom to get a demon come out to break an addiction to have a moment when you come and you give your life to Jesus Christ you walk out and you feel better for a week it's another thing to make that feel better turn it into be better for a lifetime and for generations yet to come can somebody say amen for those of you who think that's not possible for those of you who think that to keep a healing is not possible to keep prosperity is not possible to maintain your health is not possible but since we're talking more about freedom and deliverance today to maintain freedom from an addiction or from a bad habit is not possible I want to tell you something it is possible but there are certain things you have to keep in mind and I'm going to share those things with you my goal today is not to just give you a few points my goal is to be very practical today so that your life can carry a resemblance of freedom Jesus paid a high price for you to have our freedom didn't come cheaply for God it comes freely for us but it cost Jesus his blood and it cost him his life and we should treasure it and not only treasure it but have that freedom become a lifestyle become a habit in our life and become a destiny and a legacy for generation to come and somebody say amen you know I remember when I heard people being free from you know things like pornography things like you know for me smoking and drinking wasn't really the thing that I was addicted to I tried smoking when I was younger and I did it for for a week because it was cool and then I found out our family is going to immigrate to the United States and in, in the capital country they will do a scan on our body and I was so freaked out that if parents will find out that my lungs were not clean they'll leave me in Ukraine 
And so, well, they wouldn't leave me in Ukraine, but I'm being a little bit exaggerated. But I knew that I will face a discipline. And in, in Ukraine, you know, the discipline was a little bit different than the discipline here. Spanking, well, you wish for spanking. <laughs> spanking was, was the base. It's the other things that I was worried about and stuff. And so I knew that they would drive that demon of smoking out of my life one way or the other. There was no prayer line but there was rods and wires and a lot of other belts and those evil spirits would leave really quickly. But the area of my life where I, where I struggled in, where I was addicted in, it was the area of pornography. And I would go in for a month without looking at pornography and no matter how hard I tried, a month later I would fall into it. And when I received that freedom and it was done not just at the prayer but it involved a lot of discipline, it involved a lot of prayer and fasting and renouncing. You know my fear was that this won't last. My fear was that you know what this is this is gonna be like a few months and I'm gonna fall because well all men struggle and all men fall. And I had to break down a mental lie. First of all not all men. Jesus didn't fall. He was a man. I'm pretty sure Apostle Paul didn't live like that and I'm pretty sure that Jesus Christ like he said whom the Son sets free is not free for six months. It says free indeed. And I had to believe in that and receive it that listen that Jesus Christ wants to be free indeed. Not because I'm better than other people. Not because I put the most discipline and I've applied the most you know effort. But because my Jesus is not interested in setting me free for a season. He wants to set me free permanently and for a lifetime. Can somebody say amen. And today that's no longer you know it's been I, I, I think it's been a decade now it's no longer even in my thought that it's possible to fall and people say well can, are you afraid that you can fall yes temptation is always there but when you live your life free indeed you'll move from that sin and it becomes so far from you just like for example other sins like murder you know for you you don't wander around every day thinking am I gonna commit today murder or not if you've never done that that's never an issue and that's how God wants the issues you're struggling today to be so foreign to you that honestly in your mind you when the enemy brings that against you you say that's not possible I'm not the same person I'm a new creation I died with Christ 2,000 years ago I, you're talking to a new Joe you're talking to a new Bill and a new Bill doesn't do these things because you're free and you're free indeed and somebody say amen Let's write down just three simple points on how to maintain our freedom from this scripture. The first one is put up a fight. The Bible says in here that when the evil spirit goes out of a man, he goes to dry places. Dry places. And interestingly enough, in the dry place, he could not find rest. He found rest in a clean place but he couldn't find a rest in a dry place. One of the reasons he couldn't find a rest in a dry place I believe is because just because that place was dry that place was not willing to put up with demons living there. Demons are gonna find rest anywhere they are not resisted. Anywhere they are not fought against demons will find rest anywhere they are not fought against anywhere they are welcomed anywhere they are assisted they will find rest there many times when a person gets free when a person receives prayer and they feel a sensation they feel this knowing God set me free they go from the service and they say I don't want to drink no more I'm not going to look at pornography no more they take that pack of cigarettes and they dump it on the way home Maybe they practice a homosexual lifestyle and say, you know what, I'm not going that lifestyle no more. It's going to take me time to rebuild my feelings and my, you know, my, my, my consciousness and my mind, but I'm not going to go in that lifestyle no more. A person who used a razor to relieve their pain, throw that away and say, you know what, Jesus' blood is enough. I'm not going to do that again. And they felt that power. But this is what happens. Three, four days later, they don't feel that again. On the opposite, what they will begin to feel again is old thoughts coming back. Old feelings flocking at them. And a person begins to feel dry emotionally. Have you been dry? 
Have you, you know what I'm talking about. When you feel like, I don't feel what I used to feel at Wednesday night. That presence, that hype, that excitement, that drive, that good vibes, they left. And it feels like I actually never got free in the first place because same feelings are crouching back. And the lie of the enemy is this. I've never been free in the first place. All of that was a good pep talk and it was Vlad and others manipulating my emotions. That's exactly what happened to Israel. Israel got free from Egypt, walked with boldness from Egypt for three days. And three days later, Pharaoh assembled his chariots and did not go meet Israelites to give them a farewell gift. He went back to take him back to slavery and when Israel saw that, dryness came in inside. And what did they say? Moses, you lie to us. All of that was fake and we knew it. They experienced exactly the same thing we all experience. And God tells Israelites, do not be afraid and don't surrender. God says, I want you to keep fighting. I want you to keep going through and I will give you a victory. Do not give up in your dry place after you get free. Put up a fight. Satan is not as persistent as he claims to be. Satan is not as persistent as he appears to be. The Bible says resist him and he will flee. That means he has a very small persistence level. He's very impatient devil and if you stand your ground in your dry place he will leave you alone. Your feeling should not stop your fighting. Write that down. Feeling dry shouldn't stop your fighting spirit. Your feelings should not stop your fightings. Write that down. My feelings should not stop my fightings. When you feel dry, that doesn't mean that the enemy has to have rest. You put up a fight and no you might not be at your best but give what you have and God will multiply that and defeat the enemy on your behalf. Do not think for a moment that when you get free of something it immediately will never come back but once once it comes back make sure that demon meets a different person. A person who doesn't throw up hands in the air and says oh yes take me again. A person who says if you take one more step I'll shoot. You have to be radical and persistent. I know sometimes people say, but Vlad, I can't. I feel so dry. I feel so empty. I feel so not motivated. I feel like the pressure is so high. It's true. Dry places can be hard places. But it does not mean Satan has to be given a place to rest because you're dry. You might be dry, but you're not dead. You might be dry but you're not done. You might be dry but you're not finished. You might, you're only going through the dry place. You're not going to live in a dry place because God is your shepherd and he leads you to green pastures and still waters and he restores your soul and he leads you through the valley of the shadow of death and he prepares a table in front of your enemies. When you are in a dry place, listen, do not give up hope. Do not throw down your confession. Do not believe what you feel. Believe what you know. I know my Redeemer lives, Job said, when places were dry. And he says, he will restore my soul in the last day. He will restore my flesh. Believe what you confessed. Believe what you know when you are in a dry place. It's in a dry place when you give and financially you feel like things are going backwards and the enemy says you're the biggest fool. They lied to you. Every one of us, if we will tell our stories, we had moments when we gave, when things went south and it felt like the bottom fell off of under our feet and you know what we had to hold on to? Our God is faithful. 
we didn't trust what we felt we didn't trust what we saw and we definitely didn't trust what the letter and the bill said we had to trust in our provider and God came through and we became stronger and the devil became weaker in our life put up a fight put up a fight some of you you guys are like fighters I, I know some people even in this room you're, you're scandalous people you create a scandal where there is no scandal you create a drama when everything is peaceful you come drama comes and that is a good characteristic applied in the wrong place when the enemy comes against you like a flood create drama use it against him create a fight put on a fight you may say well I can't fight at least put up a sword open up your lips don't say what you feel say what you know don't say what you feel say what you know and you will see the enemy will leave can somebody say amen sometimes this is all it takes when you got healed and then the sickness comes back what do you say oh I didn't get healed no you say listen sickness you came to the wrong address I can give you my neighbor's houses but you're talking to the wrong person I am not this I am healed by the stripes of Jesus Christ and I rebuke that in Jesus mighty name number two be be or get fit get fit so put up a fight number two get fit we see in here when the demon comes back to the house he finds it swept and put in order it's interesting that finding the house being clean a demon could not enter the house because it was clean watch this very carefully a demon could not enter the house because the house was swept and cleansed until that demon went and found seven other demons that were worse and wanted to attack that house something happens that repels demons from your life like nothing else it's when you clean up your life we call that discipline when Jesus talked about a sexual sin of lust and he said if a man looks at a woman with lust in his heart he says he has committed adultery and then Jesus gives the cure of how to deal with that, with that lust and it's interesting that Jesus knowing the spiritual world better than anyone else Jesus is cure for this particular sin and I believe few other sins as well Jesus cure wasn't that if you struggle with this sin I want you to come to my disciples and they will cast the demon out of you Jesus told his disciples and the crowd he says if you have this sin he says I want you to apply death and he says I want you to it's better to go to heaven without an arm he says cut your arm off now we understand Jesus does not mean you physically cut your arm off the same way we understand when Jesus said when your right hand gives make sure your left hand doesn't know we know that left hand and right hand don't know anything and when you give with your right hand your wife knows your wife's left hand and your church treasures and the IRS know so we know that there's no way for the left hand not to know what the right hand is doing but what Jesus is saying is that motives are important and in here he's not talking about hey if your hand causes you to sin if you smoking you know take a knife and just cut your lips off actually people have done that they have removed their private parts in effort to overcome sexual sin some people even in the history gushed out their eyes and they wrote this and they still struggled with lust because Jesus did not mean that what he meant is apply discipline equivalent to excruciating pain of removing your hand and most of us the only discipline we apply will be equivalent to a paper cut If you're fighting against depression if, if if the spirit of lust is literally chasing your family if maybe you're fighting against the, the, the cutting of yourself or, or you, you have the challenges with lying or you have the, the the spirit of fear that is tormenting your life or maybe some other things it's not just 
Lord Jesus I come to prayer and deliver me but the Lord also expects you that you also apply discipline in your life that you apply effort in your life to resist Satan is not attracted by clean places apply discipline if it's with lust if it's with other things apply discipline put certain filters and sometimes I recommend it to one young man I said turn off the internet on your phone he said Vlad I can remove my hand but not the internet and I said perfect because in today's age if Jesus would have been today he wouldn't say chop your hand off he would say turn off your internet we would say oh my goodness how can I go without the internet because that's the world we live in if you want to be free you have to be willing to endure pain of discipline that is equivalent to removing or chopping part of your body it's gruesome it's excruciating but if you want to fight sin and you don't apply discipline if you want to fight that problem and you your discipline is well in the morning I asked the Lord to help me well I came to prayer line it didn't work well I put a filter in my computer and I still fell well I memorized that one verse that you told me and it still didn't work my friend that kind of a battle if American military would apply that kind of effort to fight against our wars America wouldn't exist we have a bigger enemy I am not saying it depends on your efforts but God also wants you to see you have a flesh and deliverance doesn't get rid of the flesh deliverance get rid of the demon but your discipline puts the flesh on the cross and that is something God cannot do for you it's something God can do only with you can somebody say amen get fit spiritually what does that mean establish disciplines establish routines in your life make sure your life carries a resemblance of self-denial if in your life you get everything you want you sleep as long as you want to you eat whatever your eyes see you buy whatever your soul desires and you're literally unrestrained this whatever I want I get that kind of life is very dangerous because it's hard to resist the enemy you don't give you don't fast, you don't pray, you don't sacrifice in any way. You get whatever you want. It's me, myself and I, the Holy Trinity. Well, it's going to be very hard to fight flesh, the one that you're feeding every single day. You're feeding your flesh during the moment of comfort. It will come at you and attack you in the moment of temptation. It's like the story of a family that went to the, went to the, uh, they went to the woods and they saw a lion a lion's den and they saw these lion cubs they brought the lion cub into their family and the lion cub you know was very small and the lion cub became a pet in the family they started to feed that lion cub the family got so used to it that the children played with it it became a toy it became a, a pet that everybody enjoyed and the man in the village the main chief he came to the family he says you guys you can't this is a vicious dangerous animal this is not a dog this is not a cat you're feeding it you're making it stronger one day it will snap and when it does all of the children that are playing with it it will attack the children and at one time the parents were in some kind of a festival and this cub already has grown to be a little bit bigger and out of nowhere family full of children this cub attacked every one of them and killed every one of them until that chief hearing the cries had to run to the house and shoot that cub if you feed the flesh during the days of your comfort don't be surprised it will never return the favor it will attack you during the day of your crisis starve your flesh not your body but those evil appetites wake up for morning for prayer take time to fast take time to give why because your flesh is not comfortable it's okay if your flesh is not comfortable because then in the moment of temptation your flesh is trained you tell your flesh no you're not gonna do that why because you trained it in the time of comfort but if your flesh gets spoon fed in the time of comfort well don't get surprised if it pulls this thing on you in the time of crisis and it attacks you and it destroys your life get fit amen and lastly be filled be filled the Bible says that when the demon comes and he finds the house 
and the house is clean and we talk about that you have to clean up your life it's very important but there is one more thing which allowed the demon to succeed in bringing seven other demons they were fiercer and stronger than them it's the fact that the house was empty the house wasn't occupied the house was clean but not full the house was swept but not possessed I'm not sure how the person succeeded in getting a demon out without filling their life with something else but I do know the tendency I have and so do you the tendency of reducing freedom to doing what I want instead of doing what I ought I know the human tendency of reducing deliverance to only removing evil instead of replacing evil with something that's good when God came to deliver Israel out of Egypt and through Moses he came to Pharaoh and he said to Pharaoh this we see this mentioned 17 times in nine chapters 17 times in nine chapters God into Pharaoh says this let my people we all heard that but it's what's after with the surprising 17 times God said to Pharaoh so that they may serve me it's interesting God didn't tell Pharaoh let them go so they can have a great life though that was part of the freedom God didn't say let them go so that they can be free to do what they want though that was part of the package God said let them go so they can serve me means God definition of freedom is not getting the demons out it's replacing the demons with himself it's as though before God brings you into a better life after setting you free God says before I give you a better life I'm gonna give you a better master I'll get rid of that devil that you served and I'll put myself instead of that and I'm a better than the devil I'll treat you better he beat you I'll feed you he threw your children into a Nile I'll raise them to conquer the gates of your enemies that Pharaoh he made you sick I'll make you whole that Pharaoh he made you poor I'll prosper you that Pharaoh he beat you and he made you build his pyramids and I will lift you up and give you houses you didn't build vineyards didn't plant and the wells that you didn't dig that Pharaoh he starved you I will give you manna every single day God says I want to set you free not to just kick the Pharaoh out but to take his place in your life but many times when we get free we're like well praise God finally I can do what I want well praise God I don't have to spend $300 on weed now I can buy new purses every month well praise God I'm no longer heartbroken now I am available well praise God I don't have this crazy reckless schedule where I didn't sleep now I don't live that kind of party lifestyle I go to sleep at 8 and I wake up at 8 in the morning and I good my 12 hours of sleep and when a pastor challenges the church to come to morning prayer oh no I can't do that but when you were in the world you had no curfew when you came to God there's nothing wrong with curfew but God does not want to remove evil only he wants to replace evil and if he doesn't the Bible says being empty is dangerous being free is dangerous if you are not filled can somebody say amen apostle Paul says where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom the correct verse the original language says where the spirit is Lord there is freedom look at this it doesn't say where the demons are out there is freedom it doesn't say where depression is out there is freedom uh, the way we define freedom is that once you get a demon out you're free the Bible says until the spirit is Lord you're not really free you're as free as how much control Holy Spirit has over your life sometimes the way you actually become free the way you push the darkness out is by giving God a promise that you'll serve him if he helps you sometimes the way you push the darkness out is you turn on the light 
sometimes you don't have to wait until you get free to be filled you actually get filled so you can be free you could feel so with God that it pushes the darkness out it pushes the depression out it pushes the those homosexual tendencies out it pushes those lustful desires out it pushes those human sinful things that people have it pushes that out when you get filled with God I remember a story of a little boy who had a big house and this house had two stories each story each, each level had five rooms at one time the Lord Jesus knocked on his house it's a parable he invited Jesus and put Jesus in the choicest room in his house it was a master bedroom Jesus thanked him for such a generosity and the next day there was another knock on the door and at this time it was the devil who was knocking and the boy opened the door and the devil quickly got into the house and the boy tried to get the devil out of his house and he fought him and he fought him and he fought him and he fought him and finally after an exhausting match he got the devil out he comes to Jesus' room and says Jesus did you know that the devil was in the house Jesus says I heard some screaming and yelling I was wondering what was happening he says why didn't you help me I gave you the master bedroom and you were not helping me to fight the devil and Jesus says I am an honored guest in your house you are the owner so the boy says okay I gotta give Jesus more room so he says Jesus instead of giving you a master bedroom I'm gonna give you the whole upstairs five bedrooms are yours Jesus says well I'm very gracious and very thankful for this offer the next day there's another knock on the door the boy remembering the experience of yesterday fighting the devil he decided not to open the door wide just a little bit to see who is there and if it's the devil he's gonna shut it back up as he opens it a little bit the devil sticks his foot in and they fight and they fight and they fight and they fight finally he slams the door and now he is mad at Jesus stormed upstairs says Jesus I don't understand I gave you half of my house and you're doing nothing and Jesus says little boy it's still your house where I am the guest with five rooms and the boy gets a revelation he takes the key of his house and gives it to Jesus and says Jesus from now on it's your house which room can I stay in and Jesus says go take the master bedroom where you put me in the first place and next day there's another knock on the door and the boy got up to answer the door and Jesus looked at the boy and says get back to your room guests don't answer doors so Jesus decided to go and open the door and the little boy was right behind Jesus just to see what's gonna happen he knew who's gonna be at the door and Jesus didn't open the door a little bit he didn't open the door to sneak in he opened the door wide and when the devil said Jesus he quickly got on his knee and he says sir I'm so sorry I was knocking at the wrong house It's not about giving God a little bit more of your time. It's about giving God all of your life. It's about making Spirit Lord of our life that guarantees freedom and victory. Can somebody say amen? Where the Spirit is Lord, is He Lord of your life? I know He's your Savior. I know that you call on Him. And I mentioned that on Facebook today that people say removed prayers out of schools. You know what? You'll never remove prayers out of schools. As long as there's tests in schools, there'll be prayers in schools. I know that you call on him we call on him when we get pulled over we call on him when we make a mistake we call on him when something happens and you and your girlfriend you know you maybe commit sin and you find out she's pregnant and that's when you really rush to God when we finally make a mistake you know when something doesn't work out when we get the DUI or you know when when the sickness comes and that's when we run to God and God loves us he wants to be our helper and he's our savior but that's not really what gives you freedom we all run to God like that when the airplane begins to shake nobody screams Buddha nobody screams Muhammad everybody screams Jesus atheists scream Jesus everybody screams Jesus and that's okay that is wonderful that is incredible but it will never bring freedom into your life as long as Jesus is a spare tire insurance card or as long as he has a master bedroom on Sunday from 10 to 12 but every other thing what I do is my own my friend freedom exists when the Holy Spirit is Lord in your life it's what he wants you submit your life to him 
Can somebody say amen?